My name is Douglas, and I'm building a voxel game engine. A video game world made of cubes like Minecraft, but at a much, much bigger scale. One of the things that I'm constantly thinking about with this project is performance. Gamers will notice if frames stutter or lag, and when you're dealing with this many billions of voxels, you have to optimize. There is no room for compromise. Now, I recently switched to using ray marching for my game's graphics. Ray marching is a fancy technology that allows for rendering detailed voxel scenes like this one. And while my frame times from last video were decent, I want to be able to add additional effects, like transparency, reflections, value metrics to my engine. And in order to do that, I need to squeeze every last FPS out of it that I can. So, over the past month, I've developed three key optimizations that have doubled the performance of my Voxel Ray Marcher. I'm going to share them with you in this video. But first, we need to understand a little bit more about how ray marching works in general. Drawing the voxel scene starts at the camera. We first figure out where the user's screen would be in 3D space. And for each pixel on the screen, we draw a tiny little ray, a line going out from the camera, in the direction that the user would be looking. We then march this ray through 3D space, moving it deeper and deeper into the scene until it eventually hits a piece of voxel geometry. The voxel grid itself is represented as a sparse tree, so large empty areas with no voxels in them are merged into single units that the rays can move through in just one step. The tree is divided into 4x4x4 regions, so if you've got one big empty region, and then you put a voxel inside, that empty region gets subdivided into 64 smaller pieces. I'm going to call this a voxel brick. Remember that, because it's going to be important for later. But how do the rays actually move from one empty voxel to the next? That question brings us to the first optimization, which is to use DDA instead of ray box intersection tests. The way my renderer previously worked went something like this. I would store the ray's direction and the current voxel position in local memory. Then, when it came time to step the ray, I would use a mathematical test to determine which side of the current voxel's box would be hit by the ray first. This test involves figuring out the distance along the ray to each side of the voxel box, and then performing a division by the ray length in that direction in order to figure out which one will be hit first. But this approach isn't the best, because it requires recomputing values for all three ray components, x, y, and z, every step. And in addition, it uses multiplication and division, which can take multiple clock cycles. A better way is to use the Digital Differential Analyzer algorithm, or DDA for short. The idea behind DDA is that instead of recalculating these distances every step, we store the distance along the ray's path that the ray would need to travel to hit the X, Y, and Z plane of the current voxel. The adjacent voxel that the ray needs to move into when it steps one unit corresponds to whichever plane has the shortest distance. After stepping into the next voxel, we add length to the distance component that we just used to reflect the fact that it has to travel to the next plane farther on. This is more efficient because it only requires computations on one component for each loop, and it only uses addition and subtraction once you have the algorithm set up. Those who are voxel enthusiasts are probably asking themselves why I didn't do this sooner. And the problem has to do with the fact that the DDA algorithm only works well for fixed voxel grids. You can't really use it when your voxels are various sizes, or your rays are stepping through large amounts of empty space, and then small amounts of empty space later on. To get around this in my engine, I still use ray box intersection tests when stepping between different levels of the voxel tree, or when moving between different voxel bricks. But when I'm within a voxel brick, I'm able to use DDA to step efficiently through the 4x4x4 volume. 
If anybody knows of a way to use DDA while stepping between levels, I would love to know, because so far I haven't found anything particularly helpful. Nonetheless, this optimization made a big difference when I implemented it. In this example scene, running on my low-end Intel integrated GPU, the frame times were about 120 milliseconds, and that's to be expected on an integrated GPU. But when I implemented this optimization, the frame times dropped from 120 to 100 milliseconds. And we're just getting started. That brings us to optimization number two, which is all about bitwise masking. Remember earlier how I said that I store my voxel data in four cubed bricks? Each brick consists of two parts in memory, a 64-bit mask and then a data segment containing the actual voxel values or pointers to other parts of the tree. We're concerned with the 64-bit bit mask. This is just a 64-bit binary number, so 64 zeros or ones. And since it's only a number, the computer can perform operations on all of the bits in just one cycle or two. This is cool because it allows us to pick out individual bits. We can use a bitwise AND operation to filter out a subset of the bits, or a bitwise OR to add some extra bits. With respect to my 4 cubed bricks, the 64-bit bit mask indicates which sections of the voxel grid might contain data. So for example, this voxel brick would have this number because voxels 1, 5, and 8 are all full. The idea behind bit masking is that when a ray travels through a 4 cubed brick like this, it's only going to ever visit a subset of the voxels inside. It's difficult to quantify every ray path like this in advance, but we can use some general observations to filter out a lot of the bits in the bit mask. For example, this ray is moving up and to the left, so we know that it will only ever hit voxels that are up and to the left. Similarly, this ray is moving down and to the right, so it's only possible for it to ever come into contact with these voxels down here. This is the core of the bit masking optimizations that I added to my engine. At compile time, I generate a lookup for every starting position and set of cardinal directions that array could have. And then in the ray marching shader, before I begin the DDA loop, I check the voxel position and its direction. I get the bit mask corresponding to all of the voxels that the ray could possibly hit. And in just a couple of GPU instructions, I take the bitwise AND to figure out which candidate voxels actually have data. If the bitwise AND turns up zero, meaning that there are no voxels that are both in the brick and that the ray will collide with, then the ray skips traversal within the brick and moves on to another level of the tree. After adding this to my ray marcher, the frame times on my integrated GPU dropped another 20 milliseconds, bringing me down to 80 milliseconds per frame, much closer to real time. But I wasn't finished. I had yet to implement the third optimization, the beam optimization. The beam optimization is probably the coolest of the three in my opinion. Now we've established before that the time it takes to render a frame with ray marching is proportional to the screen resolution and also the length that the rays have to travel. The beam optimization capitalizes on this. The core idea is that we render a lower resolution version of our scene with less rays. We see how far those initial rays get in the lower resolution image and then we use that distance as a starting point for the rays in our full resolution pass. This means that the full resolution rays travel a much shorter distance on average, vastly improving frame times. But there's a problem here, and this is where the real cleverness of the beam optimization comes into play. The problem is that sufficiently small voxels, or corners of objects, could slip through the cracks. For example, if we had a voxel positioned like this, where these red dots represent the rays that were casting during the low res pass, and the entire grid here represents the full resolution image. 
this pixel in between these two low resolution rays, depending upon whether it uses the left pixel or the right pixel as its starting value, might miss this tiny little voxel situated in between the rays here. The solution is to notice that if the voxel is big enough, then it must hit one of the low resolution rays. So, assuming that there's some voxel here that does cover this pixel in the full res pass, if that voxel is a certain minimum size, no matter what orientation or location it has, it will always be hit by one of the low resolution rays. Which one? We don't know exactly in advance, just one of the surrounding low res rays. As long as it's big enough on the screen, it will hit one of those. And so, in practice, what we do is to figure out the initial starting point for this in-between pixel in the full res image right here. We take the minimum of all four, or if the layout was like this, all six surrounding low resolution rays. And we also make sure that the low resolution rays never step far enough into the scene that these voxels could get smaller than that minimum size required for a voxel to always be hit by one low resolution ray. This guarantees that the beam optimization is always conservative and never misses geometry. The output image from the engine with the beam optimization on is always identical to the output image with the beam optimization off. Implementing this into my engine gained me another 20 milliseconds, bringing the frame times on my integrated GPU down from the initial benchmark of 120 to 60 milliseconds. That's a two times speed up in the engine's performance. And measuring on my NVIDIA 1660 Ti, where the game runs at over 60 FPS, I observed similar performance improvements. That's not all that I've managed to get done on the engine this month. In fact, I've been very productive. I've re-added world editing and LODs, and I've also even added a couple of new features. But that will have to wait for next video, because I'm already out of time. So if you want to see what those new features are, I ask that you please leave a like and subscribe. I'm almost at 10,000 subscribers, we can do it. Otherwise, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below. I always love hearing from you guys. Thank you very much for watching, and have a lovely day.